this is a review um, of the Mathematica 8 release, the year in review. So I was going to go through a few areas, talk about what, what it was, and give you some pointers to resources on where to learn about things. One area that we did a big upgrade for version 8 was in probability and statistics. And um, the key place to go to, uh, to see what's all there, uh, in presented sort of in a, in, a, in, a, in a hierarchic way, is in the guide page. So there's one guide page that points to then about 15 others. But, but this, this central one would be a good start. So the key thing for, that we did in probability statistics is to do, in a proper way, symbolic probability and statistics. But when we say symbolic, what we mean is sort of symbolic representation of models. It doesn't mean that we don't do numerics. It's very dependent on numerical methods um, as well. Um, I could also recommend the marketing pages that we put together for for this area, you'll find a, a more sort of a variety of examples. There's quite a few of them in, in this area. We have, um, we did a virtual conference a few weeks ago. Uh, there's a recorded presentation available from that that you can just, that I think was sent out in a newsletter just recently. And um, there's one review section in this conference. And where this goes next is that, uh, well, we're working on nine, and so we have no less than six talks that says where we go next in probability statistics. So this is not finished. We're just getting warmed up. And um, so I can greatly <coughs> recommend that. Next area that we worked on was graphs and networks. So version 8 had a first iteration of integrated support for graphs and networks. <coughs> for many years, we've had a package called Combinatorica that provided quite, quite a lot of functionality, but it, it wasn't properly integrated, it wasn't at the performance level, it, it couldn't sort of interact. Um, but graphs and networks are taking off in, in a lot of disciplines. And, uh, and um, one thing that's particularly hot right now is social media. And so we'll, we'll, you know, that's part of where it goes next is to make it really easy to do social media or social network types of analysis. Um, what we did in this first version is it's integrated. It's, it's, it's not only the sort of um, pure data structure. The data structures are built to be very scalable, very large, but also visual. It's also for illustration and visualization and, and easy interaction with all the Mathematica components. Some things that have happened since is that I, I tend to see people using it in the most kind of unexpected areas. I can talk about some of the things that we do inside of Wolfram Research. So a lot of algorithms um, for version 9, in fact, now make use of graph criteria. These are mostly performance-oriented enhancements, but they allow us to sort of squash big, complicated problems by looking at it in a more abstract way, and we kind of see where the actual hard problem that need to go to the heavy algorithms are. I'll, I'll show you some examples of that later. Um, there are three talks, at least, I think, in this conference about uh, Sorry, four talks, one review talk and three preview talks for future kinds of things that are happening in graphs and networks. So again, we're just kind of getting started, and I think it will be easy to use in, in lots of areas. Um, again, there is a guide page, which is uh, the central page, which goes to about nine others, which should give you an overview on where to get started in this area. Um, and also, there there. Uh, plenty of these, uh, the two of these marketing pages that gives you examples from a wide variety of fields. And so what happens now is that we, we continue to extend it and go deeper and, and further into many of these fields. Third area, visualization. So we've been doing visualization upgrades for quite a number of releases now. Perhaps starting with version 6, we started our sort of rejuvenation of, of graphics and visualization. And in the latest iteration in version 8, we focused on some particular um, vertical domains like statistical visualizations. Um, you know, the guide page will tell you that. A, a large part of this is about understanding distributions, comparing distributions, um, you know, like quantile plots and so on, or, or many of them. Another vertical for visualizations is financial visualization. And there it's a lot about understanding you know, basically pricing time series. One thing that kind of surprised us in this area was that when we wanted to do these, uh, these candlesticks charts, 
with indicators is that there's no end to them. Obviously, there's, you, you can come up with infinitely many. So one thing that you might not have dis discovered yet um, is if you go to, um, to, to, uh, to one of these, um, let's actually go, if you go to one of these, then um, there is about 100 of these indicators. Each one has its own uh, reference page that tells you a little bit about what it is, but there's no link. Let's do this. Um, if we go to uh, finance, we'll have um, a lot of these these indicators. Each and every one, um, you know, some of them are simple. Oops, I just clicked on one. But if we pick on one, they each have a home page, kind of like the import formats in Mathematica that describes what it is, what it's supposed to indicate. Um, and then, um, so that, that might be a sort of a gem that you kind of never, never found. Um, also lots of updates to, uh, to the, or some updates to the Mathematica graphics language, including uh, textures um, and, and a few other things. Next area, wavelet analysis. So I would say, I think what we've done in wavelet analysis, again, there's a guide page that tells you the whole story. Um, there's also a seminar. Um, I think what we've done in wavelet analysis is to, is, is to make it readily available. Um, and it's, it's generalized in various ways. It works in any number of dimensions. It works directly on sound. It works directly on images. So you can do wavelet analysis on an image directly or a, a sampled sound. Um, it, it allows you to sort of actually explore. It's one of those things which you've all heard of. You might not have had a reason to use. Wavelets are particularly efficient for things like detecting spikes. Um, you know, or, or things when frequency varies. So Fourier analysis works best when things are just static, you know, that, that's the same thing, doesn't change. Wavelets are, are very, you know, capable of dealing with sort of varying frequency content, so you have to vary your filter. And so, so lots of things that can come out of that, and um, it's just there. Final area is, I'm um, sorry, not final area, but uh, we, we always improve core algorithms, obviously. When we build new areas, we stress areas ourselves to, to, to the breaking point, pretty much, um, which is good. I love that. That means that we can then strengthen those areas, but you guys do too. So there's a steady flow of things coming in, and there are new ideas. And so um, if, we, if we look around, this, this crazy function here, um, that's a function that you can just numerically now integrate without a hiccup. It will just automatically do all the breakdowns, uh, you know, recognize the singularities and, and do the right thing. Um, so if we, um, if we look at one of these, I'll just talk about some, some area here. So there's a brand new solve. Solve is actually rewritten from the ground up. Maybe you didn't notice. That's the point of having this abstract specification of Mathematica. <coughs> Your code, sort of, for the most part, just keeps working. The methods change. Uh, so the big news for, for solve is that it takes domains. You can solve over reals or integers, um, and you can use inequalities. Um, most of you shouldn't have noticed, except it became stronger and faster. Also, little performance things actually matters. So here is a, you know, so th things that you might not use, but this is doing um, integer linear algebra. Most of you are used to floating point, real and complex linear algebra, and that's all extremely fast in Mathematica. But we've now succeeded in making um, exact linear algebra, integer rational linear algebra fast. How does it do it? it, decomp it it's a very sneaky idea. I'll just tell you this one story. And the sneaky idea is this. Since Intel and all the other hardware developers have spent so much money on building fast floating point. Why don't we use it for exact stuff? So you take a big integer. Uh, for double precision floating point, you have 53 bits of mantissa. That's just like any other you know, number thing. So you chop this integer into little pieces that are about 26 bits long. So you can multiply them together and still fit. 
So you now end up with lots of matrices, but you can now do floating point linear algebra. And you just fake it, you throw away the exponent. Um, and then, um, you know, when all things come back out, you synthesize them back together again. And that turns out to be faster than just using the actual sort of uh, fast integer algorithms and so on, because the whole chain of hardware and libraries and cache coherence and cache optimizations are so, have been so worked on for floating point. So that's an, that's an example of, of basically using a hard, you know, hardware progress. Hopefully you guys didn't notice it just worked better. It's like um, Dow, we don't, make, uh, we don't make your car, we make your car better, or whatever they say. <laughs> Um, finance, lots of uh, different kinds of features. We, we talked a little bit about visualization. There's also the obvious things. I um, mean, so there's a guide page again. Um, time value of money, how money translates through time. Either, you know, future money is worth today or today's money is worth in the future. Um, and also evaluating uh, uh, financial instruments such as derivatives and bond with, with complicated games that hopefully, you know, um, that's there to, to provide sort of flexible financial instruments but are hard to, to evaluate and, and price. And uh, we also have included um, control systems. So control systems, um, I'm sure many of you have never had a reason to use control systems, um, but it's also not that complicated. Um, and um, there's now what's basically amounts to a first or first one and a half course on control systems built into Mathematica and for the first time symbolic um, and, and, and well integrated. So one thing that you see, you know, moving forward, I forgot to say that, but moving forward, all of these areas have more developments going, going forward. But so for control systems, there's another big batch of, 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 of features coming. And also what you can see a lot in this conference is how it integrates with Mathmodelica. One thing that you need for when you're going to do a controller is what's called a plant model. And a plant model can be a car, you know, or, or something else. This, they're all just called plants. Um, and, but, but that's what Modelica is all about. It's about building plants. That's what modeling is for there. Um, conversely, if you build a model, maybe the objective was to actually control it. So these things now work hand in hand um, as, a, as they should. And finally, I think that with version 8, image processing reached a level of maturity um, that is, it is really sweet to use. So one of the things that everybody sort of tests, obviously, to do image capture and then process that, um, but also advanced algorithms like you see here, face detection and other feature detection things are sort of higher level, that's the solver type algorithms that we would like to provide. All right, that, those are the areas that I uh, wanted to cover, and I'll leave it to John. So I'm going to be talking about what we were doing in the user interface for version 8. Some of this is uh, maybe a little bit obvious because we've been rather loud and outspoken about some of these things. But, uh, uh, but I want to delve into just a little bit of detail. Um, so one of the really big accomplishments that we're talking about in version 8 is CDF and you hear it here a lot you've uh, you've heard us talking about it a lot this year uh, and if you're paying attention closely of course you might take a look at CDF and say wait isn't that just a notebook so yes when we uh, uh, when we talked about the CDF initiative uh, part of the thought was it's an easy day at the office for me uh, because we have a lot of stuff in notebooks that really builds on technology that we already had. Uh, and it just, uh, a, a lot of it was, uh, was stuff that, you know, a lot of core Mathematica people really know about, but uh, we, weren't, uh, uh, we weren't kind of pitching in a, uh, in, in a coherent way. Uh, so certainly, as you all know, uh, CDF, 
uh, is the, uh, you know, it supports the full breadth of Mathematica evaluation. Uh, and so in terms of, you know, this is the, you know, CDF, co a computable document format, um, you know, that's, that's the computable bit, that's, uh, uh, or part of the computable bit, that's really important. Also, CDF notebooks are highly structured document format, and this makes it very pliable to generation and to manipulation. And if you've never worked with, uh, with a notebook format before, and you can read it right into the kernel and do any sort of programmatic manipulation on it that you want. Uh, and this, you know, this is something that internally we do all the time. For example, our, uh, our documentation is, is authored in such a way that is not the same as what you're seeing in the, in the final build. It's authored with all kinds of extra metadata and such. And we run it through a system which takes the notebooks down, the source notebooks, and that we write our documentation and breaks it down and, and builds from that. It builds websites. It builds the, uh, uh, the notebooks which are actually used for the built-in documentation. It builds other sorts of information too, like for example, the syntax coloring, which you've come to be used to in the last few versions of Mathematica, actually built from the source uh, documentation for, uh, for all of our functionality. We have a full array of documented functions for creating and, manipulated and manipulating notebooks, or CDFs, or CDFs. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, so that's, uh, you know, a lot of this is stuff that's been there already. We've continued to add and enhance to that. So this these were the advantages that we, uh, that we brought into the game. Also documents which are fully interactive in version six, we began with, uh, we began with manipulates and a move forward from there. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, basically erasing the notion that documents are just a static flip, 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 and you're done, or the documents are something that's rooted on the web and you have to do something with Flash or JavaScript programming or something like that, uh, that you know, this, is, this is very accessible, very easy to create, doesn't, doesn't require a professional software developer to do. But there were some things that were missing. This wasn't just a matter of messaging or packaging or something like that, and, the, and, and these were things that we focused on. Uh, for, for version 8. So one of the big things is making sure that CDF is accessible everywhere. Of course, it's already accessible in Mathematica. Uh, if, you've, if you've paid to have Mathematica, uh, to get a Mathematica license onto your desktop and you're sitting in front of your desktop, this is all great. Uh, but, uh, but if we're going to have a document format that uh, that is going to gain traction. In addition to the natural qualities that it already had, accessibility was, uh, was a big issue. So we want to make sure that anybody can read these things for free. And that's where the Wolfram CDF player came in. We had a player before. It had certain sorts of limitations. And, and the people, uh, you know, in terms of being able to create active content, it was, uh, you know, you could, you could basically talk to us to create active content. That's no longer true. Now you can create active content uh, right in the product. And the, uh, uh, this is something that is, that is there right now in every version 8 that, you, that you're using. You can create a, uh, you know, a document as new CDF or, or actually uh, save a document as CDF. And if you do, it will just work on player. There are still a few limitations, but you get the full breadth of, of interactivity. Of course, you can't just think about the desktop. You have to think about the web as well. And so the web browser plugin is a big key to the initial takeoff of, of the CDF format. And you're seeing this. Uh, we're, we're spending a lot of effort uh, being able to, to deliver you know, some of our things, which used to be static, are now more interactive. Steven has been demonstrating some of them. Uh, live demonstrations, which Steven didn't demonstrate today, but if you haven't seen, you just go to the dem demonstrations page with, this, with the web browser plugin, 
uh, installed and everything just works right there in the web browser plugin. This is, uh, uh, you know, once upon a time where we were using Flash with animations, it was, it was all very clunky and now it's, now it's very elegant. One of the big things that's not totally obvious in terms of CDF was uh, there were actually some places where we could have even expanded the, the computability a bit more. The, uh, uh, there, was this, there was this big kind of hole which, uh, in, in the functionality of Mathematica, which came up, well, for those of you on Math Group, it was mentioned on Math Group a number of times over the years. Uh, we pay attention to our users. We pay attention to forms like Math Group, and, uh, and we try to respond when we can with, uh, with, with high-quality, well-designed stuff. And so uh, part of what we shipped in version 8 is Notebook Evaluates. Uh, and Notebook Evaluate is it's, it's a very kind of interesting function. There's more value to it than, than, than you might think at first. I mean, uh, certainly what we can do, and I just have a uh, quick little demo here where I just have a button with a notebook evaluate in it, and it does, you know, the very simple sort of thing of just uh, actually run through and evaluate an entire notebook. As I said earlier, notebooks are being programmatically manipulated. This kind of thing is important. The, but it's not, uh, uh, notebook evaluate allows us to actually uh, be able to do some fairly interesting things. In fact, Tom is, uh, uh, there's an effort in Tom's group to, uh, to kind of work on some report generation kind of stuff. And it's, and it's, talk about it, and uh, oh, there is a talk about yes, it. Talk yes. About it. And, and, and the technology is built on top of Notebook Evaluate uh, and the ability to, to go in and actually, have, uh, uh, to actually hit all the pieces in a particular notebook uh, and to get the, get the output you're looking at. Notebook Evaluate also allows us to, interestingly, to treat notebooks as packages. Uh, if, uh, if you find you like writing your code in notebooks uh, better than you like writing it in packages, uh, the kind of the default mode of Notebook Evaluate is actually to just uh, go ahead and evaluate all the input without necessarily populating the output, but evaluate the input as if it were package code. So a uh, lot of flexibility there. If you haven't looked at it, I, I recommend you do. There's uh, interesting stuff going on there. Big version eight accomplishment number two. Um, so I say forget the syntax, remember the cloud. What do I mean by this? This is Wolfram Alpha integration. Uh, and what I mean is that we now have a way to write Mathematica code without writing Mathematica code. Uh, for those of you who were here last year, I, I demoed this. We weren't shipping yet, but we are now. The, uh, and so now I can just type in a plain English description of the code that I want to use. And how did I do this? I just, uh, uh, I just type an equal sign, and then I type in whatever I want. And this, is, this works by going to Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha is built on top of Mathematica. So in fact, for every query, Wolfram Alpha is doing some sort of translation into Mathematica code. Now some of those queries aren't gonna make sense because they rely on something specific to Wolfram Alpha, but many of them are just very straightforward uh, translations to Mathematica. And so assuming that my network is working here, yes. Uh, so we have a translation that gives us Mathematica code for plain English input. And this can be one of the primary ways you use Mathematica if you like. This can be a teaching tool to help to understand what the syntax is like. Whatever. We're not going to judge. The, uh, uh, and for that matter, uh, you, know, you don't even have to be that precise. I didn't specify any particular ranges for x and y. That's OK. We'll from Alpha provide them. No big deal. You want to be lazy? We're okay with that. We're not going to judge. Uh, it turns out, uh, this, this little bit here, Mathematica can actually do this. How many people know the command to figure the literacy rate of Angola off the top of their heads? No? No one? Yeah, I didn't think so. Don't worry. I didn't either. That's okay. They will correct the spelling. Uh, correct the spelling, right? Well, 
why should I correct the spelling? I mean, really, we're not going to judge. <laughs> we will wait, apparently. Maybe it might have been quicker with correct spelling, but, <laughs> but really, who are you to judge? <laughs> and, uh, and you can get data which, uh, uh, oops, uh, which frankly, Mathematica doesn't even have access to at all. Uh, I mean, you know, Mathematica ha doesn't know anything about number nine screws, but that's okay. We can get it off Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha has a huge amount of databases that Mathematica doesn't have direct access to, or didn't have direct, direct access to. Now it does. And all that is available to you for the simple cost of a license of Mathematica. So those were the big things. We did a lot of little things. I'm not going to discuss all the little things, because if I did, I'd run way over my time. But I wanted to talk a little bit uh, just about uh, some of the highlights. Roger mentioned textures. If you're not using textures, they're very cool. They're very straightforward to use uh, you know, for, for doing plots. It's not, you know, it's, it's very easy. If you're, if you're creating your own polygons, you'd, oops. Um, the, let's try it again. There we go. There we go. The, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not difficult to use at all for many of the visualization, visualization functions. It's just hooked up. Uh, if you're constructing your own graphics, you have to map the coordinates. It's not very difficult. Um, we have uh, one of my other kind of favorite functions of version 8 that we worked on is overlay. Uh, which uh, there's uh, lots of examples. This was one of the ones that I pulled out of the documentation, which I wrote actually, uh, which allows you to have uh, uh, to overlay any number of objects for any purpose. In this case, I'm using alpha channels to to show two bitmaps overlaid over each other. Um, other sorts of favorite things: mouse appearance, which is fun, interesting, but also useful. Um, but in this case, it's more just fun. <laughs> so, and of course, you can do all three at once if you want. So, that's what I have to say about the user interface. Right, so I will give my view of Mathematica year in review. Um, you can see that. So again, I'm going to think a little bit about um, programming advances that were made in Mathematica 8 in the area of programming and software development. Um, again, programming language, it's kind of like a key underlying part of the system. We need to make it sort of move forward, be fast, and add more features, access you know, unique features of Mathematica, and be, be nice and current. So what sorts of things did we do? Um, so one thing we did a lot of work on is innovating and revving the Mathematica compiler, something that a lot of people make, make use of. Um, trying to make it faster and, and use it in all sorts of interesting, use it in all sorts of interesting ways. So, so one thing we did was, you know, having this, um, we have this sort of C code generation. So we had this automatic generation and linking of C code. So normal workflow for the compiler is you start out with Mathematica, it goes through the compiler, and it generates a Mathematica compiled function that contains virtual machine instructions. So we hooked up this, this sort of interface to it, sending a compilation target. And so now it goes through extra stages of automatically generating C code in a dynamic library that gets loaded into Mathematica. So the code executes at this speed of, uh, speed of Mathematica. And so here, sort of simple little example where you're computing a compiled function, but you set the compilation target goes to C, and then inside the compiled function, you can actually see a reference to a, to a library that's been dynamically generated and loaded into, into Mathematica. So getting a, often getting a pretty significant speed um, improvement. Another 
important speed improvement came from uh, compiler multi-core operation. So again, if, if the compiler typically working over a list of data in, in a serial operation, it'll just work on one, one data element at a time. But if we run it in this, this parallel mode, then the compiler can work in, in, in sort of multiple, you know, like here, you know, two, two chunks of data at a time, or here, you know, it could be, you know, six chunks of data. So many computers have multi CPUs, so this is a very lightweight way of, of getting parallel acceleration. So one typical demo that, that we came up with was this one that sort of combines both of these. And so this is kind of like the sort of ubiquitous sort of fractal thing. But this is, as I'm moving the picture around, it's regenerating the entire picture as, as it's moving around. So it's doing quite an intensive computation and it's able to sort of update this and, and, and show this in, in real time. Part of the ways that we like to use Mathematica, we like to think of Mathematica as being a platform to build things around. So it, it's kind of like a com computational operating system. It's a platform that you can program things with and link into things and set things up for sort of in, in, in interesting development. And so one type of this was um, adding more features for integrating with C code. And so we, we hooked up a code generator that lets you build standalone um, code that could run sort of standalone outside of Mathematica, again generated from the Mathematica compiler. And so here I've got this sort of standalone piece of code that you could compile into a library or another application, and it would, it would sort of execute in, independently of, of, of Mathematica. Um, and I, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of, there's extensive documentation and examples for all these features. So an underlying feature that sat behind this was um, this uh, symbolic C feature, which is a symbolic representation of, of C code. And this was a nice way to work with C code. Um, now the idea of these symbolic things that we're, we're really starting to take off with a lot of these things, symbolic applications of you know, HTML, JavaScript, you know, et cetera. And, and the reason why they're really powerful is I, I, I sometimes see people not using a symbolic representation, they just write lots of string concatenation operations. And that's desperately fragile. And usually it goes wrong and it's inflexible and, you know, and, and it's, it's fragile. It's also very hard to use. You know, it, you're missing out on a lot of opportunities. So the, the symbolic C feature, I mean, here's just some, you know, I can just sort of build up a set of, um, set of things. And so here's kind of like an entire function. That's the symbolic representation. But then when I convert it into, you know, I actually use a function and that converts it into the actual string representation. So, so why is this useful? It's, it's useful, for example, if I want to sort of rewrite the code. So here's kind of like a symbolic C expression and that's that's kind of what it looks like and if i wanted to change this or tweak it i can just use a mathematica program to say for example find this sort of this part of the thing and then rewrite it in in some other way so so doing this with string operations is going to be fragile and get things get things wrong so this is kind of like the sort of you know, powerful way, really exploiting Mathematica's symbolic structure um, for this. So another thing that I, w I was really pleased to add in, in Mathematica 8 was a new way to connect external C code into Mathematica based upon dynamic library loading. And this is a much, has, has a lot of advantages over the, the previous way of doing this was using MathLink and um, so the advantage of dynamic library loading is it, it can be much, much better, faster and better memory performance because you can share data between Mathematica and the library. And this is now becoming the, when, when we implement things at Wolfram Research, 
th this is how we, we implement things. And the nice thing about this is it makes Mathematica, it's less of a closed system, and it means when we're building Mathematica, we're building it in the same way that you're building it. And that's, that's got to be a, a sort of powerful sort of thing. So here's just a little diagram about the way that this, this works. So this is the sort of MathLink way. So you have one process that's, that's the Mathematica process, and there's the Math the math link process and they kind of communicate and this is the library link way of doing things so the the actual library is actually in the mathematic process and that's why it can sort of share memory now there are still advantages over the um the, the math link way you know you can mix uh different machines so the math link way you can mix 32-bit and 64-bit apps and you can have things running on different machines and, and a big thing, of course, is that when it's running like this, if your C code, you know, in your library crashes, then the Mathematica kernel will crash as well. So that's, that's you know, you might, you know, you might not have that. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of a trade-off. But um, one, one nice example that we put together um, that we're using, um, it's, it's there in version 8. It's becoming a more integral part of the uh, finite element uh, features that we've, we've got for um, that, that'll be coming out in, in the future is this uh, TechGen, um, <clears throat> TechGen, which is this, you know, sort of mesh generator and 3D Delaunay triangulator, and that it's got lots of nice, nice features and things. But one of the things that's worth looking at if you're interested in building a library and in integrating things, it's, it's you know, we, we use this kind of as a sort of reference implementation just to show how you could lay out you know, integrating a library into Mathematica and, uh, and using it. So that's, that's, that's kind of a useful, a useful thing. Another, another feature, this also uses library link and it would be hard to make this work so well, was our integration with uh, CUDA and, 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 and OpenCL. So this is another nice, nice important feature of, of Mathematica. So CUDA is this very parallel technology that uses the graphics, the GPU, the, the graphics processing units on, on a computer, and, and it can potentially give very, very high performance. And so, you know, it's got lots of cores, so this only goes to 2008, but this is like a regular, you know, regular Pentium, and then this is showing how the growth of the uh, GPU technology sort of grows, grow, you know, sort of moves forward. Um, again, so we added this uh, CUDA link, toolkit for linking Mathematica and CUDA. So it, built lots of specialized tools for sort of matrix computation, image processing, and, it, and it, we, we just felt this was a very streamlined way of accessing into the sort of CUDA tool set, which, you know, more traditional ways of working with it involve lots of sort of hairy C programming and sort of, you know, awkward type, types of work. So we, we, we made some, some, some advances there. So that's my sort of urine review of what was in Mathematica uh, eight. Thank you. Right. Thank you.